terrible for humans uh, when you're talking about objects. If you actually wanted to write the RDF or read the RDF, um, and this is oh, there the, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, this has been kind of a, a speed bump for us in SBall, and I expect for anybody else who's using RDF to talk about objects. Um, and there's a, there is a nice, an almost nice JSON <laughs> format for RDF, which is about this close to being actually something that a human could author in the way that like lots of people, even biologists are comfortable writing JSON. So this is what uh, you know I wanna aim at and what we've got a session for talking about tomorrow morning. Um, you know, to elaborate this, um, you. Consider you know, a simple plasmid. I took you know, one of the standard iGen plasmids and I threw away all but two features for my example. Uh, very simple to you know, draw this up. We're talking about something very simple. It's just a sequence with two features on it. We can represent this in SBall with two top level objects, one for the sequence with two features, uh, sorry, one for the component with two features and one for its sequence. Um, but since our current RDF serializations are bad for humans, um, the, we end up with something that may be enormous and is typically terrible. Uh, so like if we use the current JSON serialization, we end up with 113 lines to represent these two top level objects. Uh, that is uh, unacceptable. And there's a whole bunch of other properties that we really like in our serialization that none of them Really have so the you know three main ones that we usually think about are you know, JSON LD, um, which is terrible. Um, mostly right now, uh, you know, at, at BBM and work with IGEM, we're using sorted n triples. N triples is sort of the least represent the least serialization you could possibly have. And if you use just generic n, it's all the pretty terrible. But if you sort them, then sorting gives you a lot of nice properties. And in between, there's turtle, which is kind of the, the one that you tell people to write in if they're going to actually write something. But it's also, you know, wrong and bad, and you shouldn't use that. Um, you know, the turtle and JSON uh, have a problem that the uh, stuff that comes out of them is not stable in its ordering. So if you're trying to version control something, then every time you emit the file, you get a different file. Um, and that's wrong and bad. N triples is as well. And that's why we just pass it through a Unix sort function. And now we have something diff friendly because it at least traverses the graph. You know, it, it, it is so non structured. Um, sorted N triples, though, puts all your URIs must be full length. Um, and where Turtle and JSON LD do allow you to make it short, um, Turtle even allows you to, you know, not necessarily have to have a prefix. Um, JSON LD also makes you wrap your URIs to turn them into objects. You can't just put a URI in. That's part of where it gets so verbose. Oh, yeah. And in all of these, your URIs have to be opaque, uh, by which I mean that, like, if I want to say, uh, you know, that I'm going to use, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> sequence ontology linear, I have to say sequence ontology, whatever the heck the number is. I can't just say SO colon linear, which is what we really want to do. And what using libraries like Taito, which got talked about at one of these meetings last year, uh, you know, now in code, we never use the numbers. Um, so we should let our serializations take advantage of that ability to just use the damn names. How do you match the name being linear into the original number? Um, just have that name linear unique. So how it's done in Taito is basically you digest the ontology into um, you know, a, a dictionary, which is used on the back end. Oh, so, so you use that, that package to do the um, transformation of the back of the number. That's, that's how we do it with, in code. And I want to do the same thing with the serialization, which will assume that somebody has a piece of code like that sitting around in the library for digesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, locality is another problem. So that uh, internal or if I spit out the file, we've got a plasmid with two features, and the plasmid may end up over here, and one feature up here, and one feature down there. At least sorted in triples, they end up in the same place when you sort them. 
Uh, and of course, neither of these do anything about hierarchy or implicit names. So just to show what the other ones look like and what I would like to propose to build for this, um, you know, here's sorted end triples. Um, I've gotten pretty good at reading these. Nobody should ever write these. It's a terribly verbose form uh, with a huge amount of redundant information. And um, yeah, uh, turtle, you can actually think about writing this, but uh, you may notice, for example, um, you know, we've got the component here and the feature here and a feature here. It's all, you know, the, the actual hierarchical structure of this is all sprayed out all over the page. And it gets even worse in JSON LD. I mean, the purists say that that doesn't matter. <laughs> but it does if I want the human to be able to write it. Because what I, what no, I, part I, of what's motivating me here is I want people to be able to write metadata just as a scrap of JSON yeah. in the same way that, like, if you're doing, you know, the setup.py or, you know, equivalent configs in Python or some other library, you just write down the JSON and it's fine. So here's the sort of thing that I want to actually be able to write. This is the complete um, JSON for in the proposed format that I want to <laughs> we can do. Declare your namespaces up top, declare one of them as a default. And here I'm defaulting the SBAL one. So everything is explicitly in the SBAL namespace unless you say otherwise, or unless it's got a special thing like the at type and at ID. Um, and now we really just have, you know, one statement for each of the pieces of information that we have. This is a component, uh, which is in my package with this, uh, you know, local ID. Here's its description. Here's its types. And I'm using SO circular and SBO. Well, I wish SBO had, a, could, had just DNA and not deoxyribonucleic acid being spelled out every time. But that's SBO. Uh, and it's an engineered region. And then here's my features. You know, the range fits all on one line. Um, here's the sequence down here. So I think that this should not be hard to do. I'd like to see if you know, we can both implement it and maybe get it used across a lot of different communities that care about RDF. So if people are interested, hopefully, they can engage at the session tomorrow, and maybe we can even figure out how to bring this to uh, you know, the RDF standards in general. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Online? I'm here. Oh, you're here. All right, come on up. Yeah, I gotta get connected to the Zoom real quick. Absolutely. Do this while I'm moving down there. We go. All right, I will stop share. See the Jerry. Jake, what tooling do you use to read that stuff? Python. To, to read all the RDF? Yeah. Yeah. RDF with? Oh, from Python. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we've refused to write any of our own tools whenever yeah. possible. Yeah. So yeah. I'd really like to not write a utility of our own. I'd really love to be able to bring a new format to RDF with. Yeah. But of course, that's. Engaging with much larger communities. Sorry if this feeds back. There's a lot of numbers. Following the following the first one, yeah. Yeah. We've abolished numbers for node at this point. So. Yeah. I think you, you might run into spelling troubles when there's a logger really that's closely related by the Chelsea in my house mm -hmm. in Teddy. So you gotta have a different name for each entry. So actually the most interesting problem we've run into in spelling is in the um, unit ontology studies. So uh, where uh, the official names are the in uh, it's like the Dutch version. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so you know, you get a leader with an R E rather than E R. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe what the rest of the world is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not speaking American because then I'd be using split. <laughs> 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 All right. I think I'm good.
since he got this back a couple days ago, so I'm still working on so. <laughs> this. All right, let's see. Right, One there's left. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my first talk. Okay. Yeah. I've got two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If if you want, we can come back. There's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's move on. I'll, okay, yeah, I'll jump back. Yeah. Figure that out, and we'll yeah. come back to you whenever you're ready. All right. In that case, who's next? We have other oh, DJ and SB Badger. Oh, right. Um, Michael was not able to be here for this, so I'm going to sort of summarize what I know about it, which isn't a ton. Um, but SB Badger is a way to generate a bunch of random networks. Um, and it's important to note uh, that there is no such thing as just sort of a pure random network. <laughs> if like your choices of how to connect things and how how nodes are connected and how the reactions all uh, net networks are formed. Um, make a big difference in, uh, in, in the result. And you may want one kind of random network to do one kind of test and another kind of random network to do a different kind of test. Oh, I do need to share. Yeah, sorry. By the way, these are, these are not graphs. These are full kinetic models. Okay. okay. All right, there we go. Yeah. Specify the degree distribution. Come on. <laughs> There. Yes. Fine. All right. Um, so these are the so and let me go back up a thing. So in general, um, this, this is a it's a Python package. You can use you can generate uh, models, distributions, networks, uh, rate laws, um, all in different ways uh, with with different uh, functions. Let's see if I can figure this one out. All right. Um, this is degree of connect connectivity, I think. Um, so you choose a particular distribution of connectivity, um, sample from the posterior to create a bunch of edges um, in and, and your like in in nodes and versus out nodes are, are have different ed types of things. You distribute the species of the distributions and end up with a and here is your now randomly generated network based on all your input types, uh, all the things that you've said. Um, you, you can also gen generate kinetics for these, for these models. Um, it has a bunch of different ones, mass action, generalized, generalized mass action, little log, generalized you know, smetan, uh, saturable and cooperative, modular, um, so it will, it will generate these networks uh, with with particular reaction network kinetics for you. Um, again, and and the uh, the values will also be can be randomly generated as well. So you're all your k values and everything else, um, and they are somewhat reasonable um, and and random in quotes in a in a fairly high very specific form. Um, and we've generated networks just two nodes, five nodes, ten nodes. Uh, you can. And you can generate any number of, of networks from all these situations. Can I ask for that yeah. if you want? Yeah. Fact that there, so this is unpublished work, but I don't know if any of you know the Sydney algorithm. Oh, R Sydney. Yeah. It was uh, based on um, parametric data. The idea was to infer the model um, by, basic, by basically um, you'd have columns representing different terms that you do in the model, and then you do this sort of regression fit, and you would then pick out terms 
uh, some of the terms that would more likely match the model. And it was a PNF paper, big plus about it. Um, but we can't get it to work. Even a small model just can't recreate even the simplest thing. You know, you're going to be talking to them yeah. soon about this. Let's see the work. So yeah, if you if you were want to test your your like like can I accurately re recapitulate a particular uh, set of models? You can generate your random thing, generate data from it, and then give the data to your system and see like can I actually re reproduce the yeah. model that it came from? Yeah, the whole purpose of this package is to yeah. um, do benchmarking work. Yeah. So as a no student in my lab, Janice, she, she's using the benchmark uh, the Bayesian algorithm for creating metabolic models. Yeah. Make sure the algorithm works really well. That's right. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I just sigma you can add in different amounts of noise to your data as well, um, or different amounts of noise to the the kinetic parameters, which then generate different uh, levels of output data. So you don't have to just you don't just necessarily perturb the output points. You have with the you perturb the uh, kinetic parameters that generated those output points. Um, and that's it. Frank, you're up next. Yeah, okay, great. What's the name of that? Uh, SB Badger. Hello, I'm Frank, and uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, PHR, uh, data for more specifying parameter estimation setups. And uh, we have been here at our meetings a couple of times before, I'll just to recap uh, briefly what it is. We have our model defined in SPML, right? And additionally to that, we have a couple of um, tab tablet data uh, files that uh, have a specific format that describe our measurements, our parameters, the experimental conditions, all that we need for our parameter estimation uh, setup. And uh, while initially it was a grassroots efforts by the Hasenauer group, uh, and later um, I joined the um, developed on in, in uh, income hackathons. We have since uh, adopted the uh, community guidelines from the uh, combined community. We have an uh, officially openly elected editorial board, um, issue trackers, and user forms available. Um, it is supported by um, a major parameter estimation. Um, uh, tools like Amici, Topazi, B2B, and Pinesco. And we have a uh, library available on uh, PTAP, and it has been published in 2021. So what has happened since the last year? Uh, we have adopted um, and accepted a proposal to extend beyond um, just SPML. And we have an uh, implementation available there uh, to apply SP that is worked by Daniel Weinberg and target furnish. And basically, we just have to have a small uh, version change where we specify what kind of language is a certain model. And in case the identifiers don't map our, our simple scheme that we use in PHAP to uh, assign data on models, there can be a mappings file that makes this mapping possible. So maybe Salomel can now jump on board too. Well, ISB, uh, that's, that's a rule based. They don't have a, I don't know what it is. They don't have a model standard. They well, I mean, match it to... they, um, PSV is compatible with ENGL and it can be converted to SPML, huh? but basically it's just the rules that are easily uh, identified that way. So, I mean, PSV is normally run as a script, right? But, mm -hmm. so, but uh, what do you, what is this? Use does it use the BioNet Gen file? No, I mean, um, I'll uh, uh, use the software by by Fabian for at least that, of course, to use it. But I mean, uh, what about the, there is no model, the there is no model. Well, if the language of PSB it has a formal specification, it's, it's not one right. of mine, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm sure you could discuss with Fabian all about it. That's um, a hard one to do, it isn't a model no, it's not language at all. Yeah, it's right. it's, it's it has nothing to do with the PT. Somebody could yeah. change the scripting API and then you're dead in the water. You have to discuss that with okay. Okay. Right. Right. Those um, but I have something that would work very nicely with the last presentation at the Lucian Jet Plan. 
and that is um, model selection. Um, and uh, it's uh, worked by uh, Dylan, uh, who created this amazing library for key tab select. So how we modify the, the tab specification, additionally now to the uh, tab problem, we say, what is our model space? We consider like a network like this, right? We have individual reactions that could be there and could not be there. You might want to estimate some parameters. You want to mix, uh, fix some parameters. And if you do this systematically, right, you quickly get into uh, quite intractable numbers. And what Dylan has done here, he has implemented this library. He has implemented selection algorithms, forward selection, backward selection. And um, all the tool now is supposed to do is um, the library suggests you a couple of models to evaluate. You calibrate them in your in your key tab tool, um, and the library even uh, computes the selection criteria for you um, out of those. And so instead of having to uh, look through the whole uh, model space through course, it would just suggest you candidate models and improves on those. How did it decide on the candidate models? So how do you start up the initial model population? Well, um, in in the files that we have here, I mean, it could be multiple models, right? Yeah. Uh, the model space files as here's my model and here's the parameters you can modify now. Um, in in this case here, it was the superset model. Like we have one model with all of the reactions in that. Yeah. And then the model space says, oh, how about you knock off this one? Uh, oh, it will do the adjustment itself. Yeah, it, it generates a new e tab problem oh, with see. the model to oh, uh, calibrate and then goes from there. Does it add, you know, add reactions too? It does not add reactions, but you can refer to multiple models, right? In the model space file, you say, I uh, you have your first model with those reactions and those parameters, and you have a second model with different ones. Or, like Dylan did here, he created a superset model of all potential reactions. Oh, that's massive. That would be massive. That depends. I mean, in, in your example, last it was just 10 nodes. Oh, and every really combination of that is massive. You know that. Yeah, yeah, what we did when you can like, enumerate like, networks. That's, 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 that's the network, right? Oh, yeah. Because imagine if, it, if your network is too massive to write down, what do you think is uh, looking through all it's of the. It's not the network the, is too like, big to write down, it's the number of combinations is too big. It's, it's probably a billion or more. more. But it's the computation is even more expensive. Right. That's why I say you should be you should be allowed to add reactions. You should take a you should take a reaction that what the biologist think is roughly what they think is right, and then after that you start tweaking it, adding or deleting things, trying to improve it. Okay, but you so can I'm transform starting. you can from transform that into this format very easily with one step, right? Yeah. Right. That's you the way take thinking. this model, add this reaction, and uh, a library can convert that yeah, into yeah, okay. that model with right. them. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't okay. take anything away from the from the selection problem. Uh, yeah, so no, no, no. You want to you yeah, you want to exploit the selection system. Yeah. But you need another layer, I think, to do the model modification at some point. Definitely. Yeah. I mean it just um rather than now uh, I mean here what we need right now is just one model space file that says what are the different combinations to check for you. Yeah. And we didn't want to have like another language that describes now how to modify individual models. But that can be added as a library step. I mean, you could easily invoke Tullerium, like No, we did something yeah. similar like this about two years ago, a thousand models. And uh, yeah. we did the enumeration ourselves. But but just I mean, this is this is just for writing down the model, right? Here yeah. if to evaluate which one is the best one, you have to uh, do parameter fitting on two to thirty-two models. Yeah. Okay. Do you just take them out one at a time, or do you do combinations? Um, so PTAP will, will um, for each step of the refinement process, it gives you a set of candidate models and tells you, give me the calibration rates for those. And then you can put them on your cluster. You can do it sequentially, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, just at the end of that step, um, you give the calibrated rates back to the library, and it gives you a new set of calibrated models. Once you don't get any more, you're done. Yeah, okay. I oh, am. Yeah. Uh, implementation is available in PyPesto, uh, Basico, one of mine. And um, we started in the hackathon uh, on Friday, and the PTAP Julia Library is going to implement that as well. And with that, I just want to point out briefly that I set up a record session on Python tools. And basically, what I plan to do there, I'm going to tell you 
Um, what I did at Basico, I'm interested to see what happened in the sauna um, and the different tools. And ideally, um, if any of you would present what, what you have, um, that would be great. And from there on, I was hoping that we maybe compare notes. What worked well for us? Like, what's the best way to do logging? What is the best way to use CMake to compile your underlying C++ projects to use in Python APIs, things like that? And maybe is there collaborations that would happen? Uh, or is there something else that we should look? And that's happening on Thursday morning. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. multi-package and also rule-based modeling. The multi-package had been uh, released for a while. And in the last couple of combined meeting and harmony, we have some interesting and uh, nice uh, discussion uh, had touched with the, the multi-package. So I'm thinking to use this opportunity to try to revisit uh, this topic and especially to uh, if you accept the topic of multi package itself, it's, it's pretty detailed and it's not that trivial. So I try to uh, bring this topic back to see any new to new group can take advantage of this package. So here I try to use one single, so uh, myself work in the one uh, rule based volume two and I got Simeon. So I just try to use Simeon to explain. In general, rule based modeling, you can see on the left side, we have the three reactions. Uh, you have similar shared component and the features. And by using rule based modeling, modeling approach, we can summarize that one single rule is tied into pattern relationship. This in general is simple way to explain how rule based mod modeling uh, to work. Oh, oh, sorry, just click somewhere. Sorry. <laughs> Here, sorry. There, I'm not going to deal with it. Okay, yeah. So, for Ruby's modules, uh, Simil, uh, Simil, and also well known the biomachine also root, uh, by using the Ruby's modeling approach and the Kappa and the biochemical space from Google from Czech Republic. And last common meeting of we have presentation about Morpheus. And you can see, so I here I will not go to very details, but we have uh, the code running the format uh, to call the rule based model. Uh, this is very broad. Uh, it summarizes the how the multi package to extend current SPML core. And so you can see the black color that means original. Uh, the multi package and the blue color is new uh, uh, data structure introduced by uh, that multi, and the green color is slam class uh, extended from uh, from the the, the core uh, HTML core part. The key part you can see uh, we can have the specified. This is the class. Uh, Introduce actually reintroduced because the earlier you working on the multi, uh, the, the SPMA already used the, this one. And uh, rule this morning, you can see the detail by handling the uh, describe the bending relationship. So we introduced bending set specific type and the, the feature state with by using the feature tag and also. Uh, the internal bundling we introduce by using the uh, the in species bound. And by using this way, we can uh, have a constructor to formulate a template. And the correspondingly uh, for the species, we by extent current as uh, the class species, uh, we can refer from species to those uh, classes of uh, objects uh, of the class. 
uh, by reference relationship. And then we can describe the details. Moreover, when we um, handle some example, it's not only uh, by handle multi uh, component, multi feature. Also, we some uh, feature can exist in the multi compartment, especially some. Uh, I have a latest uh, slide to explain the details how this multi compartment, because in recent discussion, the multi cell multi-scale uh, and uh, uh, many, many groups interested in this part. So I have the last slide to explain uh, the uh, relationship there. Here is my example. You can see we, for bioenergy model, we can, uh, by using Ruben there, can uh, do the simulation by simple model file and then export, export it to the, the multi uh, data format uh, for our simulation import, uh, then we can reproduce the simulation result. Another use case by uh, take advantage of secondary theory, for example, uh, the bionet model we can export to multi. Then uh, in our simulation, we have network viewer. Then we can, by using this to, to explore the relationship in you know, uh, the model from the bionet. Uh, this one is try to, I try to explain. So uh, it, it's, there's some recursive relationships. You can see from the left side, we can be describe uh, the compartment as a type, the equation from current HTML. Uh, and then we can how in the real case, because for, for we have the detailed uh, the situation, for example, some two molecules, they may have the cis bending or they have trans bending how they take advantage of those component type relationship. So as I mentioned, multi itself is, is very detailed. So I have a poster. So, uh, and also we have a, a brief session tomorrow. So if, yeah, each week we can uh, discuss more about how can take advantage of multi package. Okay. Thanks so much. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I was just going to tell you all this very exciting Spark Codathon that it's perfect and vouch for as a judge last year. <laughs> um, it's very good. Lots of cash. Um, Sorry, yeah, just click somewhere and then you can. So just to summarize, the, the Spark is a big NIH program that we're, we're part of, um, and this will be the third year we're running this codathon. Um, we have fifty thousand in cash from NIH. <laughs> we can win cash. <laughs> I think so the $100 it goes for the participants, not for the institution. Yeah, yeah, direct direct to your bank account. Direct to your bank account. It, it'll take six to nine months to get to you, <laughs> <laughs> but you will get it. <laughs> um, so um, this um, Spark is this pro program about understanding the autonomic nervous system. Um, there's a lot of semantics, there's a lot of modeling, there's a lot of simulation, a lot of data analysis, a lot of visualization. Um, so there's all sorts of opportunities, and essentially in, in this three day Codathon, there'll be a bunch of projects that you can join the team. Um, you can propose projects and it's either you know using existing tools and resources or the, using the data. Um, there's terabytes and terabytes of data available. Um, so you can just see um, in the corner there the, the projects from last year. Um, essentially, the, the one that took out the prize um, was this sort of Python code to, to work with the metadata. Um, I guess, unlike Jake, we're not quite so enthusiastic about biologists using JSON. Um, and so we use Excel um, to give them sort of these templated things to enter. And so all the metadata and Spark comes in sort of through these things, but it's a big knowledge base where it all gets ingested um, and is available and for working with. Um, there's one on using the Jupyter, um, Jupyter notebooks. So we have these, you might better see in the corner, these sort of maps, which are, are using the sort of GIS based systems to draw out anatomy and then ways to pull those into Jupyter notebooks and, and connect to the data and things like that. 
Um, so lots of opportunities, um, you know, analyzing omics data and things like that. So this year, um, it's happening August 7th, we'll surely be announcing a call for project proposals. Um, so you know, can suggest projects, you can put your hand up to lead them. Anyone except the three of us in the back row can participate anywhere in the world. I think even Herbert could maybe give it a go this year if you wanted to not be a judge. You, um, well, I'll pick a <laughs> you don't have to be funded by spy. No, any, anyone anywhere in the world can, can sign up. Um, all you have to do is have internet for three days, um, give up a weekend, depending on the number of teams and stuff. But the last two times, first prize has been $20,000 for between five or six people. It's a lot of fun. All the feedback we get from people is it's good. They enjoy it. They do, people come with, do people come with ideas or are you like assigned the group and say like, so we go yeah. two two phase application sort of thing where the first phase people propose projects mm -hmm. um, and then we'll work with those people to sort of refine them to make sure they're doable in a couple of days and relevant to the spark. Um, and they can volunteer the lead or just say, here's an idea, take it or leave it. Um, then we'll put out a list of projects and everyone can sign up to join a team and say, hey, I want to work on that project or that project, or I just want to have fun. Then we try and allocate teams based on sort of making them relatively equal, um, depending on how many we get, sort of five or six is, is what we aim for in a team. Um, the one thing we learned the first time we ran it, we tried to make everyone equally disperse around the globe. So everyone was equally handicapped <laughs> in time zones. Um, didn't work so well. <laughs> so now we do try to group people by time zone. And if you already have your own team that you really, really want to work together, you can just tell us and we might let you do that. Go, but yeah, anyone's welcome to participate. Um, there's a mailing list you can sign up for if you want to keep get notified if you're not already on the Spark mailing list. Um, but yeah, otherwise we'll be putting out a call for projects shortly. Oh, not you. Okay. Not you. So close for you. Yeah. So we've been, I think this title slide is just adding the O's on the so <laughs> the last couple of times. But we are we are making progress. Um, so what have we been doing around this area? Well, Telemel 2.0.1 came out. A couple of months ago, I think the actual that publication date was February. Not sure. But it's just some some minor edits and a couple of corrections. We made one correction on the day it was supposed to be published. <laughs> so we're still finding corrections. So, but I think that one, the Salamel two, is now looking pretty pretty good and fixed. Um, so, what have we been doing for LibSalamel, which is trying to get that. That CLML specification into code. Uh, we've we're now supporting uh, permissive parser of CLML documents, so um, you can load in your old 1.0, 1.1 models uh, and into our CLML two data structures, and that works pretty well. We tested this over uh, the models in PMR. I just found 1500 models there. I think it was about uh, 800 or 900. Uh, passed just fine, validated fine, and then the remaining 700 or so either had some validation errors. I think only a couple had parsing errors, so that was it's pretty, pretty decent if your one, 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 one model is anything close to a reasonable standard, it should pass just fine. Does that mean that the, there were many that were not actually compliant with someone one point? Oh, yeah, it was one. Yeah, okay, few, so that, that's the problem. Some, some the model itself stopped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not CellML, <laughs> yeah. What would happen if you imported the CellML one model with reactions? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I did on a, I did, I did on a, I searched PMR for all CellML models, and then I downloaded all those models, and then I, I parsed them all, and yeah. I them all, and then I summarized it. <laughs> I didn't look at what, what was actually in the models. I didn't do that until afterwards. I'm looking to see what the problems were, what yeah. sort of failures were happening. 
if I remember right, I think they took out all the on PMR. There are no reaction options. Do you use the cell ML or to replace the old bit that you had for the cell ML? I could, in theory. I've been, in theory, waiting for 1.0, which means I can wait forever. So, I sorry. <laughs> so, so other other stuff we've been doing is is really around um, the ecosystem. Um, using GitHub Actions is quite popular now for doing stuff. Makes it really automated. Hit a couple of buttons, and and we're, we're deploying things. Uh, we've also matched up libcellml to this to, to be consistent with all the other combine standards for the Python support, um, which just makes us seem much more uh, part of the team. We're doing our own thing, so that was, that was a good thing. Uh, we've been doing a bit of work on our, our website libcellml.org. And we've, I don't know, uh, um, the LibCellML is quite uh, testing focused. We're, we're actually test driven development uh, paradigm that we use. And I have also now been adding testing to our actual website. So if you can see when things broke, um, we've been breaking things and not noticing until we've actually put it on production and gone, oh, that's not working anywhere. <laughs> so now we've added some testing, um, Selenium testing. So that's something nice for us. Um, uh, one other thing about the lip is that we've, we've always, we've always insisted on having 100% line coverage in our testing. Every bit of code, line of code in our library is, is tested. And recently um, we've been Doing this also for branches, the LLVM um, analyzer now lets you analyze how many branches you've got covered and uncovered. So now, now we've got 100% branch coverage. Um, so every every path through the code is now exercised, which is great. I think from that, we found about 8% of our branches actually had bugs that we, we, we covered them, and about 2% of those. Were quite serious bugs, and in one of those situations, it was like, "Wow, that is not working at all." Like what I would expect in actual practice. So that was it was a great exercise for us, and now and our our coverage is, is really top notch. And people will probably say, "Well, does that mean you've got no bugs?" No, no we've still got bugs. <laughs> still, still plenty of bugs. Um, so what are, what are, what are we going to try and focus on here? Well, I, 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 one of the things I was interested in is this um, um, sensitivity, model sensitivity stuff, where I wanted to um, take uh, an SPML model, keep it to my CellML model, and then and then run it with a CMML simulation experiment. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I started, I created the simplest model I could. SPML distribute package just give me a, a, a variable and, and and sample it from a normal distribution. With Pump it into a, to, uh, an external variable from my CellML model. So uh, I thought that would be easy. I can just say that that guy is my external for that guy, and I can just explain all my CellML. And first problem I have is uh, how, how do I get my CellML variable fixed to my SPML model variable? It's, uh, this is going to be a problem. So I'm hoping I'm going to talk, about, talk to people about that here today and try, and try and sort out how one might connect these things up because I think that's the next. Frontier and modeling for us is to get you're talking about like how to get selenol, uh, selenol to talk to the to, yeah, to, you can to, to, to get my CCNL into to, my from my from one, the output of one as the input of another, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so, yeah, that's, yeah. so that's, I can see that, that will be the that's yeah. the next frontier that I'm trying yeah. to look at. Um, Alan Garney's been doing a lot of work on DAE, so this is really when we. Uh, the the old Salomon API, which was the original support for Salomon One, so one for one, has has support for DAEs, and Lib Salomon doesn't quite yet. And this is something that we're very close to having now. So at that point, when when we have DAEs in Lib Salomon, we can say we have a replacement for Salomon API. Use this now. It's got all the functionality that you you'd have from Salomon API. Um, a much better package, much more. Uh, usable. What the DAE? Okay. Um, so the other, so there's other things we need to work on to get to 1.0. Is our validation was 
that we were validating the 2.0 specification. Now it's 2.0.1. We need to update that. We've changed, moved some things around, um, and we need, and we've we we've, we've gone through and just checked what we actually mean to validate and what things can we validate with our lips and because some things just don't uh, carry across from the specification into a into a Python or a, a actual actual application. You lose a lot of the so you can't validate certain things. Um, so the big the big thing we've got to work on that to finalize to get to version one is the set of resets and so like the idea of Resetting a variable um, and under any sort of testing step you want to do it under. I want to, I want to do some documentation reorganization um, and, and update our tutorials because our tutorials are written for probably a 0 0.2 version of the library. Now we've got 0 0.4 released. Um, surely, hopefully, by this week we've got a 0 0.5 out and the documentation is probably a little bit out of sync with that. We've changed, moved some APIs around if you want to get that sorted. So I've got a bit of work to do. Hopefully get some of these things done while I'm here. And um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Great. Yeah, all right. You have yours on your computer? Okay, so indeed, a quick update on the legal time call. So, basically, when it comes to standards, we have the model equations like this, and then the Plus, and obviously, in our case, we use sediment, which you have just described. Very quickly through deep sediment, and then we use sediment, and then we end up with open core. And open core being a plugin based environment, we can also have Python support, and that will be a bit of the focus of the talk in a minute. And we can also interact with other tools. We are two tools in our in our firm. But I won't go too much into detail. So, open course, some of you may know that it is a modeling environment which is used for organizing, editing, simulating, and analyzing sentiment files before from Windows Linux Mac. It's a plugin based, as I just mentioned, and both both on the command line and for a graphical user interface. It has full sentiment support, partial sentiment support, open source. We have a very simple website, GitHub, everything is on GitHub. Very few prerequisites, Git, CMX, C++, 2 chain, and Qt, that's all you need. There are lots of dependencies, but we have pre, um, pre bit binaries, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, open core, it looks like this. So everything is plug-in based, as I said. So all those uh, windows here, dark windows, are plug-in. So you can disable, enable anything you want. You can edit sentiment file. So it is a um, it is a XML format, but we have a way to render it in such a way that it is much easier for people to edit sentiment file. We have that equation renderer, which makes it much easier for people to see. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I meant, mathematically speaking. Then you can simulate. Here we use sediment as well for this. That's why here the rendering is very coarse because I wanted to highlight the fact that we can have uh, different symbols as well. And we can, as I mentioned, have, we have plugin, therefore we can interact with different tools. So here, for instance, which is a, we interacted with a 
zinc, which is a graphical way to render simulations in 3D. Here we have also Jupyter notebooks. We have Python Super. And that is actually it's, uh, the issue that we currently have with the black hole, which is that um, when it comes to Python Super, the original plan was to be able to interact with our QT based graphical user interface. However, we realized with time that people actually didn't care to be able to interact with open code the graphical user interface. They just wanted to be able to run the Python script and that's it. So my point is that here within OpenCore, we use Python QT, and that has had a big downside, which is that we had to ship OpenCore with a very specific version of Python, 3.7.5 in our case, together with some Python packages, which means that every time we had a new snapshot of OpenCore, people had to reinstall their packages, et cetera, et cetera, which is very tedious. I tried it myself at some point, I was like, why did we do that? <laughs> and the reason is that we wanted to be able to interact with the community based GUI. But at the end of the day, as I said, nobody ever did that. bad code to start with. But yeah. So recently we released 0 0.7, 0 0.7 version of OpenCore and 0 0.7.1. And this is going to be the only ver official version of OpenCore with this type of Python support because now what we are going to focus on, what we are started focusing on, is to develop a pure C++ library, so no Qt, no nothing. And the idea of that library is to replace the open course current backend. So all the simulation side and all those things. So we have started doing that. And the idea is to have put CellML support as we try to prove deep CellML this time. So that means CellML 2.0 support, as well as you mentioned, CellML 1.0 1.1 support. Then partial or full CellML support. So that's something that is still planning because I know that at some point with bio uh, simulators, uh, Jonathan Carr had a project to kind of uh, write us a CDML library and now that it's gone. So I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> so, yeah. And when it comes to Python bindings with that C library, we do it via Python elements. So the idea is really to try to make that deep open core as Pythoning as possible when it comes to the Python bind. And I think Python even is quite good for that. So at this point, deep open core is purely C++, but we already have the pipe to binding all working and everything. Again, that's it on an open source project, Apache V2, simple website. Everything again is on uh, GitHub. This time, uh, oh yeah. Like you mentioned, for this element, we rely on GitHub Actions a lot for all the the, the aspects for testing on a live open core. Again, prerequisites are very simple: Git, CMake, C++ solution. That's all you need. Again, we have a lot of dependencies, but we provide uh, free build binaries as well for that. You can still build your own binaries for the different uh, packages that we use. But if you don't want to do that, then you need is in CMake and C++ solution. We have lots of uh, optional uh, tools as well that we can use for Python and testing or whatever. But yeah, I try to make it as simple as possible for people to try to get going if you wish. And that's pretty much where we are. And um, so basically, at this point, we are waiting for Lips element. Well, actually, Lips element, as far as I'm concerned, is good enough for me to use to get started. Not to mention that uh, you just said that we have worked on the DAs, so that is done. So that is not officially part of Lip Cinema as such. I have my own brain that I'm able to use within Lip Open Core. So, yeah, that was a very quick overview of where we are. So, hopefully, by combine, that would be more. Yeah. Any all right, back to David. Uh, are you on this? You are. Um, let's say through in very last minute, and I think that's the only slide. Okay, I'm making this one more. Um, so some of you may remember a while ago we started a journal. It was fun. <laughs> um, busy home. Um, and really trying to, you know, sort of publish these reproducible models with demonstrated reproducibility. Um, and when we did that, someone made a random website that was awesome, um, horrible. 
<laughs> but recently we've, we've partnered with a, a company called Curve Note, um, which you may know. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of fairly young company that have this sort of publishing platform um, where they're trying to sort of really get the way people publish science, really. Um, and getting away from a, a PDF as the sort of main thing that you're publishing. And so working with them, we now have a new website. It's much cooler, got a lot of new features, um, same content. Um, but it actually looks like a real website. <laughs> it does, like, um, gets us away from the sort of slightly unprofessional looking website we had before. Um, behind the scenes, it does a lot of work in terms of extracting all the sort of journal metadata um, that you need for indexing and things like PubMed Central um, and formatting that according to the sort of current best practices and standards um, in the publishing world, um, which Kirk knows has been doing for us, which is really great. Um, and so the sorts of things, you know, you get for free now is, you know, it's probably better to just look at the website, but, you know, you can see citations in place. So all, all about seeing the content without having to scroll around. You can see the references where they are. You can see, you know, table references. You can actually just see a pop up of the table right there without having to scroll around and lose what you were thinking about. See the references within tables and things like that. Um, so if you're keen, go have a look. Um, if you're really keen, submit something. Um, we're currently still uh, asking people to submit LaTeX, um, either written on Overleaf or something similar. Um, and then once we get that LaTeX, we can process it through um, to produce the content that gets in here. Um, and going forward, we'll be looking at how we can use the CurveNote platform directly. Um, as a way to edit articles and some of them using even more of their cool features uh, that will get us much more to that sort of interactive articles we have all the simulations and things embedded in place and they do work with Jupyter notebooks as well um, and so we'll hopefully get to the point where you can sort of jump around all these things directly you now uh, what do you mean it works with Jupyter Notebooks? Like you can access the article or? Uh, so Curve, Curve Note, the platform, you can have your articles linking with Jupyter Notebooks. So you can take a, a you know, interactive plot or something from your notebook, just embed it directly in the article, and it's sort of a live connection. Um, they don't it currently execute the Python code or anything directly in, in the article, but it's Sort of a version link they have all the sort of commenting so you can comment in the article and it shows up in your notebook to collaboratively edit these things is that is that an existing feature for other like jupyter notebooks and article interaction or was that do you have to invent something there uh so that's something curve note have but i haven't seen it anywhere else um so for curve note there's a sort of jupyter a browser extension that you install that lets you connect to your Jupyter notebook. Um, but I think they're working in other ways to also just embed Python directly in the browser. There's, there is another um, usage that's similar to that in um, certain textbooks. The Libre text is publishing a number of textbooks that are using interactive Jupyter notebooks so we can, for example, have a way of a physical chemistry textbook with the MMI to react and change things in RAM that we need to put wide in the textbooks. I think that's it. Right. Great. Uh, also, this is online. Uh, yep. Uh, can you hear me? All right. I will stop sharing here, so you should be able to share for a bit. Yep. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Share. Oh, sorry, not this one. Okay. Give me a second. Okay, this one. Yep. Can you see this slide now? Yeah. Yep. There we go. 
Great. Yeah, I start. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Usopp, and I'm joining remotely. Nice to meet you. So today I'll present AMS, Automatic Model Annotation System, which is being developed as a Python package. So I start with um, emphasizing the importance of annotations. So this reaction ODC is from Biomodel 190 from the Biomodels repository. Just by looking at this reaction, you can you might have many questions like, uh, what is ORN, what is P, basically what are the species, what do they mean, as well as what the reaction does or what the reaction is. Uh, you will have these questions unless you will have additional information. Similarly, this is another reaction from a different model from the big repository. They are, they look kind of similar, but you still have questions about the species and reaction un, until you have additional information. So this information is provided by the annotation. Um, uh, fortunately, both reactions uh, provide annotations and they do mean the same thing, which is the conversion of ornithine to putrescine. And now you can see both reactions actually mean the same thing, even though the first one is shorter than the other. This way, uh, annotations really provide crucial information to understand the behaviors and meanings of the models. You can even compare different models, uh, probably like this, uh, if they have common annotations. So they do a lot of things. Unfortunately, uh, we found many existing models do not have annotations like this. Uh, this statistics is from uh, 1000 biomodels. Uh, of all a species, we found 34% or not was not annotated. Our uh, reactions, 51% was not really annotated. And AMS is trying to help this annotate in the process. And this is the overview of uh, AMS algorithm. This is being developed as a pip installable Python package. And um, basically AMS makes predictions on annotations uh, for species and reactions. And using the annotation, using the recommendations, um, it can also critique if the annotation already exists. And I show the process. Uh, this R or NDC is from the previous uh, slide. It's a second reaction, and it has like four species as components. So it uh, AMS takes a Curie element first, um, which is just uh, for 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 species, it's a name, and for reaction, it's a collection of species. Uh, first, it filters out if it determines it de it decides information is not enough, and it doesn't. It just rejects the element. Otherwise, it calculates uh, what we call a match score. It's basically the similarity between the Curie element um, and the elements in the reference database. We are currently using Kebi for species and RIA for reactions. And it basically collect, uh, um, computes the similarity and ranks them. And this is the ranked list you see. And you can also refine further based on what the user gives. And this is, for example, the result of the predicted results, uh, predicted uh, recommendation. Um, you see that, yeah, the only thing to putrescine bo both mean the same as uh, similar activities. And I think the uh, prediction was pretty good and as well as the match score is pretty high. Um, we uh, also calculated the accuracy uh, using the uh, model elements with existing annotations. Uh, we found the accuracy was pretty good, except the species in biomodels. But we also found uh, many biomodels uh, had kind of not very informative names. And as I explained, this algorithm uses names of species to make predictions. Um, so that's why it's a bit lower than the others. You're trying to uh, improve the predictions anyways with our development. Um, we are trying to also uh, develop it uh, so they could be used as a command line tool. Um, and I feel, I hope this will be pretty easy to use once it's released. For example, this is a recommend annotation command. 
you just need to know the command name and the, to give the address of the model file. It makes some, and then it'll make some recommendations and saves as a table. This is one example of the recommendations. It provides some information as well as additional column, which can be changed like this if uh, the user wants to update the actual annotation in the uh, model file using another command, a uh, user can actually um, update the annotation that's specified in the table and saves to a new file. This process can be also automated by choosing another option. Yep, so yeah, this is a, just a brief um, demonstration. We are hoping to release it pretty soon. So if you have a chance, please try it and give us feedback. And this is uh, yeah, the photos of amazing collaborators. And thank you for listening. Oops, I stopped sharing. Can you get yourself up and running? Do you want to try right now? Sure. You want to try it? Yeah. Let's do that. Trying to get my computer to let Zoom share. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still working through all the security stuff. Like yeah. To give you one, one more, one more presentation to go through. All right. Um, in that case, we'll go ahead and go on to comes a little bit all. Assuming you are there somewhere. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I want to share my screen. Yes, that's probably the simplest. Right. All right, you can see it. <clears throat> okay, Perfect. can you see it? Yep. It's good, thanks. All right. Um, Phil. Um, I'm Gonzalo Vidal, and I will present you Pudu, Build and Test Automation for Simbio. Um, so first, Pudu is a Python package that facilitates the creation of OT2 liquid handling robot protocols. Uh, it can be used, it, it can use as ball design as input to create a protocol to assemble a DNA. Um, capturing data and metadata into a small format. Um, the protocol consists on a human readable uh, instruction in Excel to set the OT2 deck and a Python script to run the protocol. So, Pudu uh, aids in bio researchers by connecting the design and build stage, accepting as well as input, as well as lists or dictionaries of parts. It automates domestication of G-blocks, combinatorial assembly of parts or devices using loop. And then the protocol uh, produces a plasmid and that can be transformed into a host or chassis using PUDO as well. Finally, Pudu automates the setup of a test by adding samples and supplements into a 96 well plate. It even helps you to produce uh, an IGM RGB fluorescence calibration plate. And then the researchers just need to take the plate and place it into the plate reader, obtain data, and feed the data back into the design. Um, Pudu integrates very well with our previous tools uh, developed around SBOL. So uh, one design tool that we presented before is Leica that outputs SBOL. Uh, this SBOL file can be then transformed uh, using SBOL utilities to be accepted by Pudu. Pudu will carry on the build stage and help you to set your test and will produce some metadata that can then can be can be an aid 
and produce like and help you to set um, uh, the instructions or to upload your data with the proper metadata to Flapjack, making this process uh, more easy. And therefore, if you have your data in Flapjack, Flapjack is connected to Loika and you can go around again. Um, so um, that's it. I thank Carlos Vidal, Lucas Vigro, Matt Boric, David Markham, Chris Myers, and Timothy Raj for collaborating with me in this project, as well as uh, IGEM Engineering Committee, IGEM as well, the whole Genetic Logic Lab, and ICOS. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey. Hey, look at that. Nice. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for the headache. All right. But yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think I don't know a lot of you here. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is TJ Sego. I just uh, started at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Um, before that, I was working with James Glazier and my postdoc at Indiana University, and I've been working with uh, Herbert as well for a while now. So uh, I've got two two talks in a row, so I'm just going to kind of like blast through them. Uh, the first one, um, I wanted to introduce um, this new simulation software that I've been working on with Glazier and Herbert as well for the past, I don't know, maybe a year and a half or so. Uh, yeah, a couple of years now. Uh, so this is... Uh, a simulation package called Tissue Forge, uh, which is three dimensional mo modeling and simulation using uh, particle dynamics. And uh, so the scope for Tissue Forge aims to do particle based modeling at a, a really broad range of scales. Uh, so we're developing or have developed um, modeling features for everything from nanoscale, like coarse grain molecular dynamics, all the way up to uh, multicellular modeling. Um, so top left, you can see what this looks like with doing more molecular dynamics versus uh, doing like center-based modeling for, you know, somewhere on the order of um, a million cells um, in an aggregate during cell sorting. Um, and to date, currently, there are already a lot of built-in physics-based models. Um, so we've developed features for everything for uh, like solid mechanics, um, fluid mechanics modeling, um, incorporating like uh, dissipated particle dynamics. Um, of course, electrodynamics, uh, but I think probably more importantly, there's also a lot of support for user specified models. So these particle dynamics methods use a lot of um, potential and force based um, physics models. Um, Tissue Forge supports um, letting the user just sort of drop in um, their potential functions or their forces for um, just sort of like mitigating the uh, all the things that we didn't happen to have thought of and provided for them uh, beforehand. Uh, so one of the big things that I think makes Tissue Forge unique um, and particularly relevant is the support for interactive simulation. Um, so with doing uh, like model development for three-dimensional complex systems, especially Tissue Forge supports being able to execute these models, visualize them interactively in real time, um, and then of course then drop it into like headless mode, uh, dump onto a supercomputer, um, you know, incorporate GPU acceleration, so on and so forth. So there's this sort of seamless, um, you know, like interface uh, or set of like interface features to be able to pull up a window, um, inspect your code, look at the um, say events that you've implemented or test the models, um, and then send them off to the, the supercomputers to actually do um, the computing problems. And um, yeah, the other interesting thing I think that's especially useful is the ability to drop in user specified events. Um, and this is both for supporting modeling um, applications as well as integrated applications. Um, so this has a fairly robust event system that allows uh, users or let's say developers who are integrating Tissue Forge um, just sort of drop in control events that will be um, say simulated along with the main simulation loop. So you can drop in control features to be able to say control where the simulation is actually being uh, executed on a heterogeneous uh, like computing architecture, or you're just dropping in something like an agent-based model. 
to do it. Uh, multicellular simulation almost always resolves down to developing these really complicated agent-based models that get simulated along with the main built-in dynamics event system just allows users to define callback functions, register them with tissue forge, and tissue forge will just call them as the simulation is executed. And uh, accessibility is one of the other main drives uh, in uh, the scope for this project. So uh, <clears throat> Tissue Forge currently has uh, a full C, C++ and Python API. Um, so this is uh, distributed with binaries with uh, a C uh, API, uh, as well as uh, C++ binaries and a Python module, um, and uh, also support for uh, IPython and Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so with the Python API, users can um, you know, download the software, pull up a Jupyter Notebook, and start developing their models just doing scripting in a Jupyter Notebook. This pulls up um, an interactive rendering window using a lot of IPy widgets and IPy events. So they do the same sort of workflow, uh, but in a Jupyter Notebook, render it, share it, put it on their website, include it with their uh, manuscript submission, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the other big thing here that um, I think maybe um, have some uh, may have some opportunities for potential collaboration and like integration with a lot of the work here is um, a lot of the support for model sharing. Um, so we've tried to um, implement as much support as possible for being able to incorporate lots of different data types. Um, so we're supporting importing to importing from and exporting to like 3D model file formats, so like OBJ and STL and so on. Uh, so we can like read that and build our simulations from that data, or we can also export simulation states in those formats um, to be able to do, um, say, visualization and other tools or in, in browsers. And uh, yeah, lastly, it's open source, of course. Um, I tried to, uh, to uh, include in the repository um, some support for automating the build process for a lot of users who are uh, more biologically inclined and not so uh, software inclined, um, but who may be interested in developing custom features. Um, but uh, again, binaries are provided um, via Conda for Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux, so I'm debugging the M1 build uh, currently um, to, to uh, improve coverage. And, and yeah, that's uh, I can just very, very quickly show you what this actually looks like. Uh, live demos are dangerous, but I'm going to try it. Uh, so let me get my Zoom controls out of the way. Yeah, there you go. So this is a small scale version of that cell sorting simulation. So this is when running interactively in window mode um, that you can you know, interact with this. Sorry for anyone who's prone to motion sickness. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's all there. Uh, you can inspect this and, um, you know, test out what you're developing, um, generate videos, high resolution renders and movies, um, you know, or uh, once you're, once you're satisfied with your, um, you know, your hypothesis for the modeling, then send it off to uh, a big computer and let it run for a while. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I've got for Tissue Forge. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll just dive into uh, round two, and this is uh, let's see. There it is. All right. So so this is um, this is really a lot of um, why I was really excited about being here um, for this event. Um, so. Uh, and this is this is on uh, doing the network modeling, but in the multicellular simulation. So um, I wanted to to share um, what uh, those of us who do multicellular modeling, um, you know, some of the current capability in the the platforms that we uh, develop and distribute, um, or or more for me with some of the actual modeling applications. Um, so we. Um, We've been doing a lot of network modeling uh, in our multicellular simulations. So what we what we do is um, say um, we'll take a, a cell state model, whether it's an ODE model or a Boolean network or whatever, um, and we want to use that to describe what's going on in individual cells as we also simulate a dynamic heterogeneous tissue. Um, and 
you know, the, uh, the motivating problem that I, I, I like to think of for this is, uh, you know, is everything to do with notch signaling. Um, so with the spatial modelers, one of the classic examples that we like to use to justify why to do spatial modeling um, is for delta notch signaling. Um, so it's well known in, in lots of different problems where you can get these really distinct patterns of uh, delta notch expressing cells generating this really nice spatial pattern. Um, and this is all through contact mediated interactions. So there's a, you know, you can do something like assign a, a cell state model to describe what's going on inside each individual cell. And then of course, describe the interactions between those models for each, each network describes an individual model. And then you can develop one big model that describes lots of cells next to each other that are interacting through the NOC receptor. Um, and this has been done in the past. I've seen this constructed like with the Boolean models by the MAVOS people just to build this big giant uh, network model that really is just representing lots of cells. Um, and they can generate the, um, the delta notch pattern, but of course that becomes problematic when you consider that these cells move. Uh, so when cells rearrange, cells are interacting with different cells. Then of course you have to uh, do something like reconstruct the network to account for the different connectivity between the individual cells. And that becomes, well, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and so in uh, the multicellular simulation, so we do this, uh, especially in CompuCell, and CompuCell is not unique in supporting doing this kind of work. Um, PhysiCell supports this for both LibRoadRunner Lib now and also with MADLOS. Um, and this can be done with tissue forge kind of ad hoc, just using high volume modules. Um, but really, essentially, what you see going on in this simulation um, is a cell cycle model that's connected to delta notch signaling. This is being simulated in each individual cell. And then we execute this simulation and script the interactions between those networks based on the current connectivity of the cells. So if you do delta and notch signaling with cells next to each other, then you can describe those interactions just by scanning through and looking at the neighborhood of each individual cell. And so you can generate the, um, the classic delta notch spatial patterns like what you see on the, the top left. And um, at least in CompuCell, um, with the Python API on the bottom left, that's, that's, that's all the script it takes to do that. Of course, there's a MAVOS model um, behind this that's being simulated in each individual cell. But as far as like actually um, specifying those interactions for the delta notch signaling between uh, adjacent cells, there's not a lot of work. Um, and so that's fine to some extent. Um, I think it's, it's, it's useful um, in its current capability, but it raises a lot of interesting um, issues and I think important problems um, that I really wanted to just get out, um, like kind of shout it out into the void. Um, you know, some of these problems may at least partially be addressed and it may just be, um, you know, due to some of my ignorance with, with current capability outside of the multicellular um, you know, modeling world. Um, but uh, so I wanted to raise a couple of these. So um, there's really not, um, say, a good way to specify these sorts of interactions at the multicellular level. You're describing something like a, a network. Of course, at some point when developing a model, you have to draw a box around what you're describing and say, this is the universe and everything else outside of it, you know, it, it just is or it is not and is of no effect to me. But of course, that becomes really problematic when you start to describe these um, like cell state models in the context of being exposed to heterogeneous environmental conditions. In the case of delta notch signaling for a particular cell that's expressing notch, what cells that are expressing delta in its neighborhood is subject to change and how to incorporate that even in just specifying the model, um, it's not particularly clear. Um, and that gets even more difficult when it comes to trying to map those dynamics to the multicellular dynamics. Uh, for CompuCell, for example, um, we model explicit cell shape. Part of the model specification describes a target volume and, um, and how you map that to the subcellular state. Um, so we have the ability to, you know, to script and procedurally describe uh, when my cell state says X, then my say cell volume or my, my model for cell contact goes to Y. But how to actually describe that in any sort of like standard that's shareable, let alone reproducible, then it is Python script. That's essentially what it is. 
Um, and that's a big bottleneck because these models are complicated enough to develop them on your own, but to make them reproducible, let alone to be able to collaboratively develop them is, is extremely challenging. And especially when you're targeting researchers who do not have a strong background in coding. Um, and then, so for the numerical methods, which um, I also think has a lot of interesting problems. So um, I've talked a bit uh, with some of the mad boss people about this problem in the past, and they immediately raised this issue of being able to say dynamically construct or like reconstruct uh, network topologies, <laughs> executable topologies, um, where say like um, if you have say you constructed something like a network that consists of lots of sub networks that are interconnected, um, is it possible to say like rearrange that topology? Um, based on new connectivities, I don't know. And, and some of those problems I'm not particularly familiar with, but there is the, the issue of being able to capture the, what we call the fast transients. Uh, when we simulate these models at the multicellular level, we are, say, integrating over a time step of anywhere from um, a couple of seconds upwards to you know, 30 minutes. And a lot at the subcellular level um, can happen over that time. And as far as the multicellular models is concerned, that's frozen. And whatever happens at the next slow time step, that is just the state. And, and what all could have occurred during that time, we really have no way to try to say, extract that information from like the Roadrunner or, um, or comparable, let alone to actually specify being able to detect and handle like events associated with those fast transits. So, there's a ton of minutia, um, and I, I would be happy to discuss that more with people who are interested. But um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We got it working. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So much. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Ramon. I mean, it's also remote. Do we have Ramon? Okay, oh, yep, look at that. Nice. Thank you. Go for it. We haven't heard you yet. <coughs> I can see your screen. Hi. I hope I'm there you go. invisible. So let me yep, get... no, we hear you and we see your screen. Thank you. Yeah. So let me go quickly. So I'm just gonna give us give you all a quick update on uh, uh, frog and the curation of constraint-based models. So are genome scale mo metabolic models reproducible? Well, yes and no. So um, not all results are readily reproducible. You need intimate knowledge of um, what are the bounds, what are the constraints, what are the objectives. Uh, some of these are well specified, but um, even when you look at the supplementary files supplied with the uh, papers, you may not still be able to reproduce them perfectly. So these are challenges that one needs to typically grapple with. And numerical solutions are again influenced by the choice of uh, the algorithms and solvers and so on. So how does one test for reproducibility, particularly in the framework for biomodels, which has you know, lots of um, reproducible models of, uh, based on ODEs and so on that are um, uh, curated and things like that. So to counter this, we came up with um, a frog analysis that is specifically tailored to handle genome scale metabolic models and the fact that there are multiple solutions and uh, things like that. So, we'll, uh, so we, uh, we encourage users to come up with what is known as a frog report, which I'm going to explain in a moment, and a mini frog, which uh, tries to capture existing papers and so on in a framework that helps us do the curation. And so what is frog? So uh, basically, you have lots of um, uh, metabolic reactions happening within a cell, and these are converted to a stoichiometric matrix and simulated. So, and uh, those of you who are familiar with this field would know that uh, common analysis involves simulating what is known as the biomass objective function to predict what is the growth rate of the cell. And one can also perform a flux variability analysis to see what are the maximum and minimum fluxes that are possible through a given reaction. And other typical studies include uh, performing single gene deletions and uh, single reaction deletions and so on. So these are all the ones that are captured. So you have the objective, the flux variability analysis, uh, uh, gene deletions and reaction deletions. So hence the acronym FROG, slightly reordered <laughs> to make it nice. 
But basically, this involves providing reference simulation data, which you can directly compare to assess the reproducibility of your uh, uh, reported uh, results or a model. So basically, the, there are multiple frog tools I'm going to show you in a moment. And they produce all of these files. There are files that capture the objective values, the flux variability of each and every reaction, and uh, the gene deletion fluxes or essentiality. Okay, and this is a, a sort of suggested um, flowchart for uh, curating these kinds of models and bio models. So you start with constraint-based models, uh, and then you know. Uh, so if you are a new author who's uh, um, and a new publication where you're just trying to put out uh, this constraint-based model for the first time, you can directly generate the frog report and that's it, right? But uh, if you, know, you, uh, you have an existing model, you can actually try and capture the key findings uh, from the model and look at a mini frog report and submit it alongside uh, the ex your um, um, a model to biomodels. And then the curator at Biomodels would go through the uh, to, through various um, steps of uh, reproduction, essentially to look at how it tallies with the, the frog, the frog, the mini frog uh, report, as well as the frog report, and uh, so on. Es essentially, you know, there are multiple tools uh, that can uh, do this, so you can see more details uh, here. And uh, and we have about 50 odd um, uh, models in biomodels uh, with uh, frog report and we are preparing community manuscript we have a breakout session in a few minutes uh, i guess uh, and um, so please do join us there are multiple tools so there's uh, those that work in python matlab julia and so on so whatever is your favorite uh, platform you can uh, tinker around with these constraint based models and make them be producible Thank you. And if you have questions, please do drop them on chat or feel free to get in touch with us. Thank you so much. And yes, we are running a little bit late, so we probably won't have an exact label of it, but we'll get you there when we can. All right. Oh, wait, look, I have these. Oh, no, that was it. Very space infrastructure, right? All right, uh, here. I don't have a name to go along with this, but I have this. Hi, here's Lutz, um, I'm remote. All right, excellent. Here is your, uh, if you want to just, if the, this is your one screen? Yes, that's the, just one slide for the right. Fairspace project. So, All right, sweet, go ahead. ahead. Just to introduce Fairspace as a new and intensified collaboration among the uh, Virtual Tissue Simulation Projects, CompuCell 3D, Morpheus, and Tissue Forge, and others joining. So we have basically had interactions already before last in Combine in Berlin. And in the run-up to Harmony, basically our students conversely try to reproduce the simulations that the respective other simulators already published. And we brought bad and good news to Harmony. So basically, initially the students all failed and we run into problems as understanding the respective lattice um, topologies and solver stencils that were sweeping over the virtual tissues. And after exchanging between now the, the simulator groups, we could clarify actually how this is basically implemented under the hood of each simulator and now understand much better how to translate models from one simulator to the other. So we bring then also the good news of how we managed to reproduce actually simulations across the tools. And you want to share this in three breakout sessions. The first one tomorrow in the morning, 9 a.m. Let me basically <laughs> explore reproduction of these simulation efforts. Then we uh, want to uh, not leave Harmony without sharing two of the models virtual tissues in the biomodels database. So for that on Wednesday, we will annotate those tissue scale 3D spatial models with the proper cell biology ontology links and so on to really enrich the model descriptions and then have one of the CompuCell 3D models and one of the Morpheus models up in biomodels database. And you see one example here at the bottom right that's in example from polycystic kidney disease run in CompuCell 3D 
where you see how the um, tubular structures themselves dynamically over time. So that's a snapshot from a movie, from a simulation, how they um, start um, proliferating at the outer surface and then forming these extra cysts. Now, sim simulations like those, we uh, now want to reproduce in the respective other three dimensional tissue simulation platform. And then having learned lessons from these two breakout sessions, Tuesday and Wednesday, we then gather finally on Thursday to plan for standardization. So we basically want to agree on the terms, how we denote certain properties that we now understand are hidden in our simulator um, infrastructure and to expose them explicitly and define, okay, my simulator X is using, and then with a specified name, this is this lattice architecture, this is this neighborhood configuration and so on. So that will then be a part of the multi-cell ML package extension that we are planning. But we now have to extend, unfortunately, the list of items that we have to standardize. So that was estimated shorter before, but now has grown longer. So that will be our topic for the third breakout session. And some of the details on what we do are found on these three links that you can explore yourself from the, from the Google Docs. Thank you. Hope to see many of you in our breakout sessions. It's always in track C in the morning. Great, thank you. Uh, and then Bridget's project is a long time in the making. So yes. Uh, Joe, you are up. <laughs> You have your own slides? Yeah, I have my own slides. All right. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So, as I say now, for something very different. Uh, how many people here are teaching? Okay, how many people here are interested in teaching control theory to their students? <laughs> All right, so now we've got it really small. Okay, we'll adjust to the audience. Targeted lightning global. Yeah, target, very targeted well. very well. Okay, yeah. so for uh, just as an overview, I've been doing this for a couple of a couple of times. I've taught in control theory to people in the bioengineering department and broader. Lots of applications. This is traditional control theory where you have an external controller and you're trying to manage some process. As opposed to what we, you know, do with the more, you know, challenging and difficult ways about fair control mechanisms work inside of biology. So the kinds of things that control theory widely used in other engineering disciplines, uh, very little known for bioengineering students. Surprisingly, we have the same premise of we've got uncontrollable components and unreliable components that we could do, you know, be able to manage. So uh, for those of you less familiar with control theory, just, you know, sort of control theory on one side, you started with some sort of objective, typically you're, typically you're trying to regulate something like maybe a concentration of some substrate like pyruvate, you figure out some sort of pathway or process that would actually produce this, and then you figure out some input that you can use to manipulate you know, from the output. And then you wrap it around in a feedback loop and you design this controller. So that's sort of the, the steps involved there. And the course, really what it's about, any sort of introductory control theory report, is about how do you figure out, you know, is the system controllable? In other words, do you really have an input that's going to manipulate that output? In biology, this is actually really challenging. I mean, go, we've been playing a lot with different models and bio models. And it, uh, it, it's very commonly the case. It's hard to find an input to affect the output. Not surprisingly, because a lot of biology is about homeostasis. It's about not having things affect your output. So that's not too surprising. And that's probably why some of the internals of biology get to be sort of complicated. And then the controller design is the, uh, the thing that's sort of like what students actually are interested in and get into. So now we get to the point of this whole presentation. That is, that by and large, the traditional control engineering <laughs> curriculum is really sort of antithetical to students wanting to stay more than a couple of weeks. <laughs> so you start out with a whole bunch of mathematical backgrounds and you remember a lot of things from differential equations that you cried over. And then you get on to, okay, now we're gonna go on from that. We're gonna talk about Laplace transforms. Well, I didn't really understand differential equations. I'm getting the Laplace transforms. And you talk about things like poles and, um, 
you know, the, the different kinds of, of responses you look at, impulse, step, frequency response, and on, system identification. And basically, towards the end of the course, we happen on talking about control objectives and actually how you design a controller. So um, I found that when I first started doing this, it, it was a struggle to keep students going and even the students who sort of came in with the right mathematical background. So I sort of redesigned, and I haven't seen other people in other fields do it this way. We start a little bit with a different premise. Let's start with what controlling control engineering is about. You have some sort of objective. You're trying to regulate to that objective. And then I wanted some sort of rapid introduction where they get a feeling for what control engineering does, what you're doing with actually building a controller, rather than getting into all the mathematical details. So the linchpin here, which I'll give you a feeling for in the next slide, is this notion of empirical control design. That is, you have this closed loop, and now just do this by hand, just try it. It's much like if you read, you know, if you're, I, I have an interest in, in electrical circuits and playing with them, and just wire together a bunch of resistors, capacitors, and transistors. What that does it do? And then try to understand what it is that it's all about. So then as you build your way through, then once they understand the problems they're trying to solve, then you talk about the mathematical foundations. So, you know, in the end, we'll do some system, some, some system identification. So the key part to this, sort of the linchpin, is how without the mathematical foundations can you talk about control design? Oh, one more thing. Obviously, if I've reorganized things rather dramatically here. <laughs> okay. So the way I did this is um, ultimately we want to talk about a biological system. And I developed a packet to be able to use SBML models in some standard control analysis packages, something that's developed at Caltech, uh, a control analysis package. But to start simple without getting to a lot of these details, what I do is I just do it in a spreadsheet because one of the challenges also is these students are coming in without a lot of programming skills either. So you got this problem that they don't have really the mathematical background yet, and they don't have the programming skills really. So what do you do? So I was doing this in a spreadsheet and basically what you've got over here is, here's the, the simple closed loop system. Uh, the system itself is just that you're multiplying some constant times the last value that came in, and then you're adding some value of the input. That's the system that you're gonna manage. And you're trying to achieve this regulated objective of the green over here. And the starting out, with this is really just more of a video game. You've got this one parameter KP that you can control it. For those who were familiar with this, this is called proportional control. And you start out with a value of 0 0.1. Well, here's what happens. The red line is what the system does. The green line is what we want to do. Okay, students, what would you like to do? Increase or decrease it? Eventually they get it say, hey, let's increase it. So what happens? Okay, so we're now, now, now we're getting closer up here, but we're getting these oscillations. Okay, what do we do? and so on, you get the idea, okay? And then you see how it blows up. So I found that this kind of thing, this experience where they got to play interactively, do some design, go from proportional to integral and also differential controllers, do that up front and then fill in with the mathematical foundations. I found that much more effective in students, of students actually staying engaged and understanding why they really have to understand the poles of the transfer function. They don't appreciate it first. <laughs> okay. That's it. If anybody's interested, I can make this open source. Nice. Thank you. Okay. One share there. <laughs> All right. Not old, you're up. Um, okay. Parts next. There you go. Sure. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about the Python package we have developed to, that creates alias nodes for heavily connected nodes as we model model. It's called a simple alias node creator. Uh, first, let's define what's the problem here. The problem here is that when it comes to uh, uh, drawing the network of reactions for an SVML model, Usually we face a, a problem like this when we have a, a node which is connected to a bunch of other nodes and it doesn't allow us to get a good and beautiful figure of the network of reactions. We call that node a heavily connected node. And uh, 
The problem is that no matter where you put such a node in your network of reaction, you're not going to get a good uh, output and a beautiful uh, layout for your uh, network of reaction. Solution to that is using uh, multiple graphical representation for that uh, single node. Instead of having one, for example, S0 node in the network of reaction, uh, we can put, for example, four S0 nodes. And you can see that the only difference between these two diagrams is that uh, instead of that one S0, we have here four S0s, each of which uh, participate in a group of reactions. And uh, it is obvious that we are going to get a very better uh figure of that network of reactions uh so uh when it comes to svml models uh we needed to apply such, such, such a thing into that unfortunately the layout package of svml uh some, and something like that is supported because we can have more than one graphical object for one model entity like for example for one species we can have multiple uh, species clips all of them referring to that species uh, in that uh, svml model uh, the only thing that we needed here was a Python package that uh, read on a SPML model and figure out that figure out if there is uh, uh, such a node that is heavily connected in that SPML model, and then it creates some uh, other graphical objects for that uh, more than one uh, multiple, more, more than one graphical object for that, and uh, uh, that would solve our problem. So we, do, uh, we developed a very simple uh, Python package that virtually reads uh, an SPML model. <laughs> then it checks if there is a heavily connected node in that SPML model. And uh, uh, this, uh, this stage is with the help of the user. The user should uh, specify some criteria for the heavily connected node. For example, the user can say uh, how many nodes can be, the maximum number of the nodes that can be connected to a, a, a node. And for example, in this line, the user is saying that, okay, we are, we are not gonna have more than uh, four nodes connecting to another node. Other than that, you are uh, this uh, package will create a new alias node for that uh, network. Uh, or the user can specify some specific nodes. For example, the S1 can only have four nodes connected into that, and the S2 can have only three nodes connected into that. And finally, the user can get an output of that HTML model. Uh, this is a, an open source project, and the uh, uh, source code is available on GitHub, and uh, it is also available through Python. And um, thank you for Herbert that uh, came up with the idea of this project at the beginning and helping me with that. I uh, wish it was all good. Okay. The question uh, Does it uh, update the layout information or do you have to later on create the position? Uh, if there is a layout uh, information available in the model, it uh, makes use of that. If there is not uh, a lay uh, any uh, layout or other information into that, uh, uh, adds that information using another package, a stream of diagrams, that which Jim talked about um, today. One question there, your first example, you had like, first you had this ball network, right? And then you had four uh, separate networks. Would your layout algorithms have those four so nicely placed side by side? Oh, uh, because uh, they were disconnected. You're talking about this? Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, from the before to the after, can you lay out algorithm create that? Oh, no, no, there, there's no such algorithm. Yeah, no, no. If you add create a new node, for example, if you get four at zero, they are going to be placed here, and you need another algorithm to uh, uh, find the location for them. This I just did manually. I mean, we're still struggling with the layout. I mean, that's been my diagram for the new at all at the moment. But a thousand better one. Oh, yeah. So, so but some sort of auto layout you can imagine would yeah. would get you part of the way uh, from, yeah. from before to after, right? Uh yeah. So but you, so your you your thing would be the first step, step, and then you do a new auto layout that would do the next yeah. A lot of the, some layouts will just throw these four to infinity. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But graph is will keep them together. Okay. Actually, and that's yeah, we can have uh, sub graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Graph yeah. is the graph is probably. And we've also got um, Anastasia's original layout one too, which is a good one. Yeah, no, so works. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks so much. I think Bart's up next. Share my screen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Share. <clears throat> Yeah. 
click this what version is this? If you want, this is right there. If you just want to click. Oh, I was gonna. Well, I wanted to be able to, to, to do some live thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, I'm here to talk about a little app we've been working on called Make SML, Make SPML. Are you actually, be, Sorry. Oh. There. <laughs> no, it's actually it's the version you're sharing. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a web app for converting SPML to antimony and vice versa. It's sort of a broad, part of a broader initiative. We're trying to bring a lot of our tools to the web, <laughs> make them the web apps and work within the browser, make it easier for the users. So basically, this just this uh, app will easily convert antimony models to SML and vice versa. And antimony, if you're unfamiliar with, is a more easy to use human readable modeling language, and it easily converts to and from system biology markup language there. Yeah. And so make SPML will now allow you to quickly edit models and convert them and go back and forth. And as a reminder, it's a JavaScript-based client-side processing, so there's no extra server or uh, energy or server side processing needed. And our site is here. How do you get the, how do you get it to work with that money? <laughs> I'm prompting you. No, <laughs> oh, well, all right. <laughs> oh, it works with Anthem. No, no, how did you do it? How did you get that money on the web? So this what you do, you're going to describe it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. This the background and basically how it was generated because it is a JavaScript HTML application is we took inspiration from one of our previous ports for libsbml.js, which is a JavaScript port of the full libsbml. But uh, we wanted something a little simpler and Antimony has a few easier um, hooks into it. So I made a JavaScript port of libantimony Live on JS, and both these technologies use inscription to port the C over to a JavaScript file or a WebAssembly blossom. And um, this is the basic idea. And let me just go to a live. So, the basic idea is if you know, if the LibSML community update LibSML. You just have to do run the inscription and you generate a new new conversion. Yeah. 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 All right, you see this here? Yep. Okay. So again, here's the a simple antimony over here, and then it generates this. But let's start with the actual. And then we can go backwards. And we'll pick like uh, this particular environment. And this is the gold reader calcium one. And then it generates the live antimony version of it over here. And so you can read it, take a look at it, make adjustments to the equations if you want. And then, of course, switch, change it back. So, like this trivial one, like change the initial method. And then you literally just go. And let's see if I can find it. Of course, I don't know if I can find it quickly. Is that another feature is the find button? Yeah. 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 All right. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, it would be nice if we could automatically uh, regenerate those types of inscription. Like right now, the lib SML uh, JS version is still from 518, right? Yes. Way on. So um, when you go through the process, it would be nice if there would be like one build script later on that would just be updated manually. Yes. Uh, so, so say, well, it is well 519 rather than 18. 
And right now you have all this information put down in a document, a text document that yeah. you can read and then follow, but it's not, it's not executable as, as it were. Ah, yes, yes. So it would be nice if, if that I agree. could be executable, yes. then, then um, a, we could test it automatically. Yeah. You know, does this new version of libsml still work with everything or, yeah. Yeah. or not? Because otherwise somebody would have to read the text documents yeah. and, and yeah. go and follow the steps to make sure that it still works. Yeah, I would be more than interested if Herbert thinks we have time for that. Because it's a community but, request already. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it basically wants the whole thing automated, so it just generates the uh, yes. yeah, runs yeah. script and generates the. Uh, yeah, and I know that um, Kyle had worked with Paramount yeah. to get it sort of there. But the problem is that in scriptum it is really rapidly changing. Though I think it's starting to stabilize, but there is a bunch of errors when I tried to do it with the uh, libsql 5.19. But, but maybe if it's together in the hackathon. Yeah, so yeah, 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 it's one of the things. So, but yeah, that'd be great. So I can't help but bring out that when you go from SML to ant money, you strip out the annotation. No, in the no, no a, a lot of them are still there. Uh, some of them aren't, but see, most of them. If the one doesn't, it does, yeah. Yeah. it does at the bottom here. There you go. I see. Now, I'm not sure if it 100% solution would be better. Than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> like there's none of the notes make it through. Okay. Um, so, like, all, all the like okay. there's a bio model, there's a big old text description of what it is, and that gets lost right now. But apparently Lucian has plans. So <laughs> I've been given plans. But yeah. Someday, definitely. <laughs> so you can add in the description on the paper. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> the description will be Sorry, uh, kind of awkward, that. but yeah, but it's possible. Okay. The only other thing I question I just had a thought, if there are any packages inside the SPML. You convert to antimony and then you go back to the SPML, presumably. Some some of the packages say uh, antimony is compatible with FPC and yeah. distrib. Okay. Um, uh, and they pop, obviously. So, so it doesn't have layout and renders. Layout and render would keep it. Merge the I could, another option is to merge them, right? I could, I, instead yeah. of just converting a new one, I could say, like, I have a new thing and then try to merge it together. Uh, it's a little complicated, but it would save you keep all the layout and render stuff. Yeah. be possibility. That sort of thing. So, yeah. 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 Anything else? All right. Okay. Stop sharing. Very nice. All right. Perfect. Hello. All right. Uh, are you sitting sharing from here? Uh, yeah. Yes. All right. Let me share screen again. All right, there you go. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Harvey. I'm from uh, UCL, University College London, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a project funded by the Cathy Foundation. Uh, so the oh, it's quick. Sorry, oh, use the mouse there. Yeah. The aim of this project is to develop a set of tools, standards, and educational materials to enable multi-scale models of neuronal cells. So. Uh, here's an example of something that we want to end up building. Um, it's partially modeled by NeuroML and partially by SVML. Uh, so, so <clears throat> uh, a short term goal of this project is to create some educational materials for uh, all, the all the combined standards. So, starting from the combined notebooks repo created by Matthias. Um, so this repo is really nice. It's got some repressed later examples for all the different standards. And uh, we want to add also into these notebooks for basic Hello World <coughs> examples for each of the standards. So for NeuroML, this is this would be a single neuron, but we want to get this for all the other standards as well. Um, so yeah, um, these notebooks are really good. Uh, uh, you know, you can have mark, markup, you can have diagrams, equations, codes. So they're a really good at educational resource to sort of build on. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to contribute, uh, I've got the link to the repo up there. Uh, and sort of a longer term goal, 
uh, for making these multi scale models is to improve the interoperability between uh, lib SBML, lib setML, and lib neuroML. Um, so, one thing we want to do is we want to be able to load models from SBML and neuroML and then execute them in setML. Uh, so, we want to develop all this with best software practices. I mean, small documentation, testing pipelines. And then we want to make a notebook or multiple notebooks demonstrating these new capabilities. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much.